to our, I'll start again. Hello, welcome to our service this evening, whether you're with us uh, in church or whether you're participating uh, online, we're very pleased to have you with us this evening. I'm also very pleased to welcome the Reverend Donald Morrison to our pulpit this evening. Donald is no stranger to us, he's preached here a number of times, and of course Donald is also providing some uh, pastoral support to the congregation during this time of vacancy. So, uh, Donald, we welcome you and uh, very much look forward to uh, worshipping God with you this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Donald, for your welcome. It's good to be amongst you again, and I trust the Lord will bless us as we worship him together, whether we're at home or watching from a, whether we're, sorry, whether we're here in person or watching from home, a welcome. So we begin our worship by singing to God's praise in Psalm 27 from the Psalter. We sing verses 1 to 5, I believe the tune is Jackson. The Lord's my light and saving health, who shall make me dismayed? My life's strength is the Lord, of whom then shall I be afraid? When as mine enemies and foes, most wicked persons all, to eat my flesh against me rose, they stumbled and did fall. Psalm 27 from the Psalter, verses 1 to 5, six stanzas. <coughs> the Lord's my light and saving help, who shall make me this come before the Lord in prayer. One thing I of the Lord desired and will seek to obtain that all days of my life I may within God's house remain. 
of our blessed and eternal Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege and the, the joy of being able to gather in your house, the place that was built for the specific purpose of glorifying your name and, and lifting up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in this uh, a corner of the vineyard and proclaiming his lordship and calling people to come and put their faith and trust in him, he who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we thank you that we can come and worship you, O God, the one true and living God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the creator of the cosmos, the creator of things visible and things invisible, the creator of all things, except you are not the author of sin. And yet we know that sin is so prevalent in the world in which we live. But we thank you that in Jesus we have a, a wonderful Savior, one who is willing to cleanse us of our every sin, our every transgression, our every iniquity, that through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, that we can be found cleansed and, and that we can come safely into the nearer presence of the living God, the God who is holy in a way that we cannot truly comprehend and perhaps only on the other side of eternity will we uh, grasp the true nature of your holiness. Uh, but the word tells us, O oh Lord, that your eyes are too holy then to, uh, then to look upon iniquity. And, and we know that when your beloved son went to the cross, when he bore upon himself the sins of your people, then you could not look upon him the sin bearer. You had to turn away your beloved countenance for the first and only time in all e eternity. And so your son made that great cry of dereliction, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet, Lord, you were willing to forsake your son so that a multitude of saved, a multitude of sinners such as we are, men and women and boys and girls, members of a fallen race, that we might find cleansing and that we might find acceptance with you. And so we come before you this evening acknowledging that you are God. And as you say in Scripture, there is none other. We know that there are many claimants to your throne of glory. There are many who would like to push you aside, O oh Lord, but they are but created beings, and although they might uh, exert great power, yet their power is at nothing compared to the power that you exercise through the Lord Jesus Christ and, and through the Holy Spirit. So bless us this evening, O oh Lord, as we gather round your word. Speak to us through it, encourage us, and, and uh, even rebuke us if that is the situation that we are in. We thank you that your word meets us at every point of need, whatever that need might be. And we pray, Lord, not just for ourselves, but for every other gathering of your people eh, throughout the world on this Lord's Day. We thank you for the word that's already been preached and will yet be preached here and uh, later on across the Atlantic in the Americas. And we pray that your word would go forth with power for Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the, the salvation, first of the Jew and then of the Gentile. And as your word goes forth on this Lord's day, may there be much rejoicing in the presence of the angels over a great, great multitude of, of men and women, boys and girls, young and old alike from every walk of life, being taken from the kingdom of darkness and brought into the glorious kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, he who is the light of the world. And yet he turns and he points to his people and he says, you are the light of the world. And that light is not to be hidden away, but it is to be raised in such a, a, a situation that people can see it, that people can see that we have been with Christ Jesus. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would forgive us for those times when we should have said a word in season, but we did not. And other times we acted in a way that did not bring glory and honor to you. So, Lord, remember the congregation here. Bless them with all their various needs. Remember the interim moderator with these extra duties. Remember uh, the office bearers. Uh, bless them. 
eh, O Lord, and remember all who have a part to play in this congregation, whatever that part may be. Remember the home, the housebound, those who are no longer able to get out and worship here as they once did. But Lord, we thank you that we can meet you at any place and at any time. And we pray that your servants in their own homes or hospitals or nursing homes would still be able to enjoy sweet and intimate fellowship with you, the living God. Remember us as a nation, O Lord. Be with us and uh, forgive us, Lord, that we have turned our backs upon you. Forgive us, O Lord, that uh, we pay you only lip service. And we just pray for our a government, O Lord, the government in Westminster and in Hollywood. And we ask that you would forgive them, Lord, for uh, listening to the clamor of godless organizations who seek to uh, corrupt our children and draw young people away from the truth. We thank you, Lord, for the, uh, uh, for the decision that's been made over in the United States, and we trust that it will result in uh, the birth of many, many uh, more children. And we pray that what has taken place there will uh, be followed in this country also. Lord, our hearts are grieved when we consider uh, the way that uh, we uh, respond to those who, uh, though they are not yet born, yet they are made in the image and likeness of God. Be with us now and bless us. Go before us. Take away our every sin and, and free us from all the distractions that the evil one would, would uh, place before us, seeking to draw our attention away from focusing upon Christ. And in all that we do this evening, may you have the glory and may the blessings be ours. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. We sing now in Mission Praise 575, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Mortals give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. And then the chorus, lift up your heart, lift up your voice. Rejoice again, I say, rejoice.
Our reading this evening is in the Old Testament book of Numbers and chapter 10. Numbers chapter 10. And we read from verse 11. Numbers 10 from verse 11, on the 20th day of the second month of the second year, the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle of the covenant law. And then the Israelites set out from the desert of Sinai and traveled from place to place until the cloud came to rest in the desert of Paran. They set out this first time at the Lord's command through Moses. The divisions of the camp of Judah went first under their standard. Nashon, son of Aminadab, was in command. Nathanael, son of Zuar, was over the division of the tribe of Issachar. And Eliab, son of Helon, was over the division of the tribe of Zebulun. Then the tabernacle was taken down, and the Gershonites and Merarites who carried it set out. The divisions of the camp of Reuben went next. Under their standard, Eliza, son of Shedir, was in command. Shelumael, son of Zuri Shaddai, was over the division of the tribe of Simeon. And Eliasaph, son of Deul, was over the division of the tribe of Gad. Then the Korathites set out, carrying the holy things. The tabernacle was to be set up before they arrived. The divisions of the camp of Ephraim went next under their standard. Elishama, son of Amihud, was in command. Gamaliel, son of Ped, uh, Pedazur, was over the division of the tribe of Manasseh. And Abidan, son of Gideonai, was over the division of the tribe of Benjamin. Finally, as the rear guard for all the units, the divisions of the camp of Dan set out under their standard. Ahiazeh, son of Amishadai, was in command. Hagael, son of Okran, was over the division of the tribe of Asher, and Ahira, son of Enan, was over the division of the tribe of Naphtali. This was the order of march for the Israelite divisions as they set out. Now Moses said to Hobab, son of Reuel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we are setting out for the place about which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us and we will treat you well. And the Lord has promised good things to Israel. <clears throat> he answered, no, I will not go. I'm going back to my own land and my own people. But Moses said, please do not leave us. You know where we should camp in the wilderness, and you can be our eyes. If you come with us, we will share with you whatever good things the Lord gives us. So they set out from the mountain of the Lord and traveled for three days. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord went before them during those three days to find them a place to rest. The cloud of the Lord was over them by day when they set out from the camp. And whenever the Ark set out, Moses said, Rise up, Lord. May your enemies be scattered. May your foes flee before you. And whenever it came to rest, he said, Return, Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. Amen. And may the Lord add his blessing to that reading of his word. We sing now in Mission Praise 400, Lead us, Heavenly Father. Lead us o'er the world's tempestuous sea. Guard us, guide us, keep us, feed us, for we have no help but thee, yet possessing every blessing, if our God, our Father, be.
Shall we turn again for a while to the passage of Scripture we read in uh, Numbers chapter 10. Numbers chapter 10, and I want to read again from verse 29. Now Moses said to Hobab, son of Reuel the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we are setting out for the place about which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us, and we will treat you well. The Lord has promised good things to Israel. He answered, No, I will not go. I am going back to my own land and my own people. But Moses said, Please do not leave us. You know where we should camp in the wilderness, and you can be our eyes. If you come with us, we will share with you whatever good things the Lord gives us. The Christian life is often likened as a pilgrimage. The believer is on a journey. We're passing through to a, a better place. As the late John Blanchard said, we are citizens of heaven uh, making our way home. And we read in Hebrews 13, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. And the book of Numbers describes part of the journey that the Israelites made after they had left uh, the nation of Egypt. They were on their way to the promised land. And Numbers begins in the second year after the Exodus. For the first uh, two years, they had uh, left Egypt, and then eventually uh, they began under the direction of the Lord and through the various crafts people that he had provided for them uh, to manufacture the tabernacle, the tabernacle which was the precursor of the temple that would eventually be made under Solomon in Jerusalem hundreds of years later. And in the book of Numbers, it's called Numbers because there was a census, which you can read in your own time in the earlier chapters. And so we come to this point here in chapter 10, the tabernacle had been made, everything was ready, and the people, all they had to do was to follow the Lord's a guiding, and he would take them across the border into the land of Canaan. And as a child, I could never, ever understand why it took them 40 years to get from Egypt to Canaan. And try as I might, as the minister was preaching, I would be looking at these maps in the back of my Bible, and I simply could not work out how it took them 40 years. You could have gone around the whole world in that time uh, but, of course, it was only later that I came to realize that uh, they grumbled against the Lord. They got fed up eating uh, the manna day after day. They wanted to go back to Egypt, where they believed the food had been so much uh, superior. Uh, they grumbled against Moses, and so the Lord promised that none of that generation would ever see the land of promise, that they would die in the desert, and that would be their sons and their grandchildren who would eventually inherit the promised land, the land of Canaan. And so they, they wandered for 40 years until all of that generation eventually died out except Caleb and Joshua, son eh, of Nun. And so here, as they were setting out on what should have been the final leg of their journey, uh, Hobab, who was a brother-in-law to uh, Moses, decided, having visited them, he decided he was going to go back home. He didn't want to go to the promised land. He was a, a, he was a, a denizen, we might say, of the desert. He was like the present-day nomads, the Bedouins. The desert was his home, and so he made as if to leave the uh, Israelites. The Israelites were passing through. They were in transit to a fertile land. But for Hobab, the desert was his home. He was accustomed to the rigors of desert life, just as present-day nomads are. But Moses urged him, if you come with us, if you come with us, we will share with you whatever good things the Lord gives us. And there are three points that I want to look at briefly this evening. And the point one is that as the wilderness was not the home, the true home of the Israelites, so this world is not the true home for the Christian believer. We are setting out, said Moses, and when we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, when we 
come uh, to acknowledge Him as our Savior and Lord. We are entering a new phase of our lives. We are setting out. We come to faith and we set out. In the, in the first year in the desert, the Israelites had experienced the bitterness of Marah, where they came to a source of water, but it was undrinkable, it was unpalatable, and uh, uh, yet the Lord sweetened it for them. It was a token of God's care uh, for them there in the midst of the wilderness. And they also savored the refreshing tranquility of uh, Elim, a place of palm trees and springs, an oasis right there in the heart of the desert where they were able to rest. It was a beautiful place. It was a, a place of shade. It was a place to rest and a place to linger, but it was not their ultimate destination. It was not the place to stay long term. These were way stations on their journey to an ultimate destination. And our journey also as Christians has both bitter and sweet moments, times of great joy and times of great sadness, mountaintop experiences where we sometimes savor the, the joy of the Lord, and other times when sadness and darkness seems to hend us, uh, hem us in. Our journey takes us through many and varying terrains, but gradually we pass through them all as we journey on. By faith, we read in Hebrews, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And like Abraham, we too a journey by faith. We have not seen heaven. Nobody, has, nobody that we know has returned from heaven to describe it to us. But we have God's word. We have God's promise that it is a place of a bliss, a wonderful place, a place of joy reserved solely for those who acknowledge Christ Jesus as their Savior and Lord. And as Paul writes of heaven, no eye has seen no a ear has heard and a mind has conceived what the Lord has prepared for those who love him. Here we pass through the veil of tears, but in heaven all that will be left behind. We read in Revelation 21, a God will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. The rich man in the parable told by Jesus went to hell. He urged Abraham to send back poor Lazarus, that poor a homeless man who had sat at his gate longing to eat the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Uh, the rich man wanted Abraham to send Lazarus back to warn his brothers that there was a place called hell, and he didn't want them to go there. Uh, but no, replied Abraham. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. They had scripture, they had the word of the Lord, they had the promises of God concerning the fact that there is a heaven and there is a hell. And we in the free church, we believe in the sufficiency of scripture. God warns us of our peril if we should reach the end of this life without trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's word from Old to New Testament always points us to the cross, and it is only at the cross where salvation has been accomplished for sinful men and women. By faith, we press on trusting in God's word, trusting in God's promises. Jesus told Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And that's us, isn't it? We've not seen and yet we have been enabled to believe. We've been enabled to trust in God's word. And so we see the Lord Jesus Christ, not physically so, but with the eye of faith. Sadly, there are believers who, despite the word of God, often lack assurance. But 
Jesus has a word for them. Do not let your hearts be troubled, he says. Trust in God. Trust also in me, in my Father's house. There are many rooms, many mansions, as it's put in the authorized version. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. And Jesus has made that preparation. He has purchased the redemption of his people with his own blood shed on the cross at Calvary. And we read again in Hebrews 9, he entered the most holy place once for all, a never repeatable sacrifice with his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. And when the time comes for us to leave this world as we all will one day, if we are trusting in Jesus, then he will come to meet us. He will take us by the hand and he will shepherd us through the valley of the shadow into the glorious presence of his Father and our Father. So that's the first point. And the second point is that as we look to our ultimate goal, we find many distractions along the way. I grew up in London, and every year we went home. Although we lived in London for 48, 46 weeks of the year, it wasn't home. Lewis was home. And so on the day that school finished, we headed off to Euston Station. We boarded the night sleeper and uh, we headed uh, north. And on the way uh, to Lewis, we passed many beautiful places. We would go to sleep, uh, passing through the home counties, looking out at the, um, you know, the sort, of, uh, the sort of countryside that you find in that part of England. But when we woke up in the morning, we were crossing Ranach Moor, and we looked out, and there was the, 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 the mist pouring down from the quarries high up, in the mountains and lochs and, and waterfalls that we passed over. And uh, my brother and I, we would look wistfully at all these things and we would say, one day we're going to come and climb that mountain and one day we'll come and we'll fish a, that loch. And as the train went on, sometimes we would, our eyes would be flat against the glass as we looked at something uh, as it receded into the distance. But when we got to our destination, we came to a place that was so beautiful and the welcome so wonderful from our grandparents that we forgot all about the things that we had seen on the way. It meant nothing to us. We had arrived at our ultimate destination. Our destination was a place that uh, has always been dear in my heart. And the traveler may admire the passing scenery, but we're not to set our hearts upon it. We fix our eyes on Jesus. We fix our eyes on our ultimate destination. And the road there can be narrow. It can be precariously narrow at times. We're not to wander away. We're not to cling too tightly to the things of this world, things that merely entangle us, things that one day we shall leave behind Jesus may return at any time at all. Are we ready to meet with him? The Israelites looked to the Lord to provide for them on their journey. He gave them their daily portion of manna. They always had sufficient. They never lacked. And on the eve of the Sabbath, he gave them a, a double portion so that they could rest on the Sabbath day and honor the Lord. They did not build houses. They didn't settled down along the way. They lived in tents. Their world was constantly moving. The tabernacle had been designed and built to be portable. It was dismantled and reassembled again and again. Mobility was the key. They carried nothing that would hinder them on the journey. And when the Lord decided that they would move on, they rolled up their tents, shouldered their baggage, and they set out. They were not to look back wistfully like Lot's wife. And on life's journey, we are called to avoid whatever might draw us away from focusing and following Christ. In Hebrews 12, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, 
and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. It might be that when you retire, and I, looking around you, I think the majority of you, like me, are retired, but you might have worked in one of the great cities, and uh, you might be thinking to yourself, well, when I retire, I'm going to live in such and such a, a beautiful uh, part of the country. It might appear to be prosperous, and if you're still working, it might uh, have good opportunities, but it might be a spiritually arid place. I know a couple who served the Lord overseas for many years, and when they came back to Scotland, they set their hearts on a, on a very picturesque uh, village further south from here, and uh, yet it didn't take long before depression set in uh, for the wife because there wasn't a church in the area that uh, was faithful and preached the gospel. There were no other Christians to fellowship with and to, and to uh, pray with. It was a place of great spiritual aridity. And when we look to settle down, uh, we must ask ourselves, first of all, is there a true gospel preaching church? Are there Christians here who I can fellowship with and who will pray for me and for whom I also can pray? Lot, the nephew of Abraham, his herdsmen who were looking after huge flocks of sheep and goats and what have you, they started to argue with the uh, herdsmen who were working for his uncle Abraham because there was only a limited amount of water and they started to fall out and so Abraham said to Lot you you go in one direction and I'll go in the other and and you can have first choice and Lot looked down into the valley uh, below him and uh, he saw the well uh, watered plains of the Jordan Valley and that's where he chose but it turned out to be a place of spiritual desolation. There was food and water for his animals, but there was nothing for his soul. And his neighbors in Sodom did not fear the Lord. They degraded themselves in, a, in sexual immorality and lost everything, even his dignity, ending his days on a desolate mountainside. Whereas Abraham, who trusted in the Lord, prospered and was honored by the Hittites in whose land he was living. And so the third point is this, that we are to invite others to share the journey with us. We're not journeying on alone. In Revelation 7, when John was transported into the end of time, he saw a great multitude, a multitude so great that no one could count them and the promise that God gave to Abraham that his descendants, his spiritual descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the grains of sand upon the seashore. The Israelites were passing through. They were the Lord's people, and as such, they were to conduct themselves accordingly. And we, as Christians, are called to make our presence felt. We're not to hide our light under a bushel, but we are to uh, let it be seen that others too might be drawn to the greater light that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And in our speech and in the way we conduct ourselves and the way we conduct business with others, we're always to remember that we are ambassadors uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Christians are a priesthood of believers. We're called to share the gospel with others along the way. And like Moses, we are to invite them to join with us because we know that if they do so, then they too will enjoy the good things that the Lord gives us. And the greatest thing of all is to know his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to know the forgiveness of our sin, to know that we are right with God. Paul the Pharisee was filled with zeal for Judaism. He was a, he was a deeply religious man, but when he came to know the Messiah, when he came to know this Jesus whose followers he had been persecuted, his greatest desire was to win his fellow Jews, his fellow Pharisees for Christ. Brothers, we read in Romans 10, my heart's desire 
and prayer to God for the Israelites <coughs> is that they be saved. The world is full of well-meaning and very zealous Jews. They're still waiting for the Messiah to come. And it's very important that we should pray for them to point out to them that they don't have to wait a moment longer. The Messiah came 2,000 years ago, and so we are thankful that there are organizations who focus upon uh, preaching the gospel uh, to the Jews and to point out to them that Messiah has come. Remember the man who was healed in, of demon possession? He was over on the other side of the, the Sea of Galilee, and, and uh, he, he, was fill, he was full of, he was possessed by a legion of demons. But when Jesus came, he drove the demons out, and the townspeople of that area, they came and they found the man dressed, because he used to run around naked, dressed and in his right mind, and sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus said to him, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. He did so, and all the people we read were amazed. And our desire should be firstly for our own family and for our friends. Moses had known this man Hobab for 40 years. He was a brother uh, to him. And he pleaded with him, please do not leave us, because he knew that only in the company of the Lord's people would he be blessed and share the good things that the Lord had promised to his people. The inheritance that was awaiting the Lord's people would become Hobab's also. And when we come to Christ, it doesn't matter what our background is, it doesn't matter what we've done in the past, we don't tag along as camp followers. We become full members of God's household, co-heirs with Christ Jesus. And we're told here that Hobab was offered a, a specific task. You know where we should camp in the wilderness, and you can be our eyes. You can be our uh, eyes. And each one of us is given a specific task. Each one of us is given a specific talent, and we are to use that talent for the Lord. I spent two and a half years of my younger life working in the vast tracts of the Sahara Desert, and uh, sometimes we would uh, be in a Land Rover and we would have to go on a journey of perhaps 200 kilometers across a trackless desert waste, as it were, and we would take with us a Bedouin, somebody who knew the desert, somebody for whom it was home, and I remember one night, we're driving along, uh, heading to a specific uh, location where we were looking for oil, and uh, the Bedouin with us, he, he, he said to stop, switch off the engine, and he got out and he sniffed the air, and he, he just sort of looked up at the, the night sky, and then he got back into the cab, and he, he went like that. He didn't speak any French, and we didn't have any uh, Arabic, and so we followed in that direction for about an hour or two and then he told us to stop again switch off the engine and again he got out and he sniffed the air and he looked up at the stars and he told us to go that way and he took us unerringly to the very place that we wanted to go to because he knew that desert like the back of his hand and so Hobab here was given a specific task and every single one of us who knows the Lord Jesus, we are given a specific task. It might be something very simple, but uh, what God wants from us is a willingness to be available, a willingness to serve him. Have we made ourselves available to the Lord? Remember in Isaiah, whom shall I send and who will go for us, said the Lord. And Isaiah said, here I am, send me. Are we equally willing to serve the Lord in whatever capacity he might demand of us. On our journey here, we receive many tokens of God's inestimable grace. But for the Christian believer, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. And the Lord, we read, led them to a place of rest.
In the 23rd Psalm, we read the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd leads us to still waters and green pastures. He guides us in the paths of righteousness. And one day, he will take us through the valley of the shadow of death. And we need fear no evil when the time comes because he will be with us. He prepares a table for us. He anoints us with oil. He fills our cup. And finally, we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, journey's end. And I hope, my friends, that each and every one of us who has had the privilege of worshiping in this church and coming under the preaching of the gospel will be in that place at journey's end. Amen. And may the Lord add his blessing to these thoughts and meditations on his word. Eternal God, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy. We thank you for the many promises that you give to us on our journey through life. We thank you that you uphold us through times of great sadness. And other times you are with us when we rejoice, in the rejoicing in the knowledge that, that we have been made acceptable in the sight of a holy God, not because of anything that we have done, but simply because we worship a God of amazing grace. Take away anything said this evening that's not in accordance with your word. May the glory be yours and the blessings ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We conclude by singing in Psalm 25 from a Sing Psalms, and we sing verses 4 uh, four onwards. O Lord, reveal to me your ways, and all your paths help me to know. Direct and guide me in your truth. Instruct me in the way to go. You are my Savior and my God all day. I hope in you alone. Remember, Lord, your love and grace, which from past ages you have shown. The tune is Rockingham.
now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit, one God, rest and remain with you all, now and forever. Amen.